and welcome to Sunshine for Your Life. I'm going to start off by showing you a flashlight, this particular flashlight, but it does special things that I want to show for you. And what happened was, uh, to get it, I went to a party a few months ago and we had a Yankee swap. And one of the things that was available as a gift was this flashlight. And everybody wanted it. Once it was demonstrated what this flashlight could do, everybody wanted it. And I wanted it too. So as it turned out, when my number came up, I took the flashlight from the lady that was sitting next to me. And fortunately for me, one of the rules of the game was that a gift couldn't be moved more than three times. And so I was lucky enough to be able to keep it. So let me show you what this flashlight will do. It's an ordinary LED flashlight. The light goes on. I don't want to put it in anybody's eyes here. Uh, and that, But this flashlight does special things. For example, it will stretch. So now it becomes a flashlight with a pointer on the end. But stretching isn't the only thing that it does. It can twist. I can turn this flashlight up, down, or to the side. Whatever I want to do with this flashlight, I can do. It fascinated many people, and they all wanted it. Well, what's handy about it? If you're in a closet, you can look at the corners of a closet, light, a closet just by poking around with it. You can twist it to any angle that you want. It'll still light up. It gives a good quality light. I demonstrated this last night when I did a speech for a group, and somebody said, is that a laser? I hope it's not a laser. This is not a laser, I wouldn't be doing it because with a laser you can burn out a person's retina if they're looking at it and they can go blind. This is a regular LED light. This light was so popular that the people at the party was taking the address and the and the uh, on the label so so they could see if they could get one. So I'm going to put this back, screw it back in, and it becomes. I'll turn it off. I don't want to leave it running. And here you have your regular flashlight. And it's so small, you can just stick it anywhere. You can stick it in a purse or a briefcase. It doesn't take up much space, but it does a lot. So I thought, as I was explaining to the group last night that I saw, how handy for me, because I do services at rest homes. And I can bring this in and demonstrate the fact that there's light everywhere. There can be light everywhere, and Jesus is really the light of the world. That's what I would try to demonstrate with it. So when do you need light? You need light when it's darkest of all. You need light in the middle of the night when there is none. Uh, you need light if a, if a storm happens and your lights go out. Now, I was with my mother. I was living with her a few years ago, and we had a very bad storm and uh, the lights went out for about two days or so. And I was horrified by that. No television, no stove, no hot food, uh, nothing, no furnace. It was cold and no street lights. Everything was just plain gone. So for about two days, but especially at night, there was nothing you could see at all. And we did have some candles and flashlights, which helps, uh, but, but with no heat and no way to get hot food and no way to travel because no, nobody had been plowed out. It was just a bad situation. But the thing that I missed the most was not having light because I wanted light. I wanted to be able to see. So what I did was I stood by the door to the porch and looked out on the street. We were close to a, a, a main street and it was all dark until once in a while a car would drive by with its lights on and I would stand there and wait for the next car to drive by and the next car and the next car because they had their headlights on and the, those were the only lights that I could see with the headlights and all you saw when they drove by was the snow that was just down coming down in front of their lights but it was bad so uh, we have to remember that light is not just what we see the Bible talks about light the Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world so I'm going to share with you one of the beginning scriptures this morning and it's John 8 12 and I'm reading it from the King James Version, and this is what it says. 
I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And I want to read that again. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, what does that mean? Light is more than just being able to see light. Light is understanding things. How many times have we said when we understand a, co a comment, I see that, now I get it. I, now I see the light about it. You know, a comment such as that. Jesus is the light of the world. He is the hope of the world. He is the one that we need to go to. He is the one that helps us. So we need to remember that. So what does it mean to have light from God? because he is the light. He removes the darkness in your life. He shows you the right way of salvation. He delivers you from sin, and he forgives you of your sin, and it no longer has power over you. So to become a Christian means that you decide to love and follow Jesus in your life. You ask him to forgive you of anything you have ever done wrong in your life, and he is faithful to do that and he gives you eternal life. Well, he is the light of the world. The Bible also says, and I'm not, this is on the screen, I'm just kind of making a remark here. The Bible says, in him is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. That's not an exact translation, but uh, he is not, there is no darkness in him. When the Bible says that he created light, it's like in the third verse of the first chapter of Genesis. It, it said that God created the world, World and, this th and that everything was void. There was, there was nothing in it, you know. Void sometimes we think of as being darkness, and some versions translate the second verse as being in him, uh, there, was no, there was darkness, everything was void and everything was dark. But some versions consider void to be nothing was in it. He created the earth and nothing had been created in it. And then in the third chapter, uh, I'm sorry, the third verse of that first chapter of Genesis, he said, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus loves you so much that he wants you to be with him forever, and to be with him forever and, and go to heaven with him, but you need to accept him as your savior in order to do that. And when he is your light and he cleanses you from sin, then sin has no power over you. You don't have to succumb to sin at all. You make the decision to love Jesus and he is in you or the Holy Spirit is in you. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I've had college student, uh, students ask me, um, how, how do I get close to God? How do I do that? They want to have a deep, intimate relationship with God, and they just don't know how to do it. So I've discussed that with a lot of students. As a college professor, the Christian students used to come to me all the time with questions like this. And I would say things like, um, well, the Bible says that you are, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So how much closer to God can you be if you are, already have a person of, of the Trinity living inside of you. That's what the Bible says. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a triune God. Well, the Holy Spirit is in you. He is a person of the Trinity. He is living in you if you are a Christian. So you are close to God, but what you need to do is to act upon it. You need to follow his will. You need to go where he wants you to go, do what he wants you to do. You need to seek him out, and he will always respond to you, and you can find you have an intimate, healthy, wonderful relationship with God, because this is what he wants for you. And if you want that for yourself, you surely will have it. God would never uh, not allow you to be close to him. He wants you to be close to him. I have a picture, several pictures of Jesus standing at the door and knocking. And uh, various painters have produced those pictures, and they're wonderful. And you look at each of those pictures, there's no doorknob on the door. Jesus is knocking at the door. He doesn't grab a doorknob 
open it and force himself in. That's not the way those pictures are. He knocks, and then if you hear him, if you want him and you open the door, he comes in. And there are various verses to uh, explain that. One of the verses, and I'll show that to you now, is Revelation 3.20, and this is what it says. I'm going to be reading it from the NIV version, and this is what it says. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So here I am. I'll read it again. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. That eating is symbolic for having communication. I will come in if you allow me in. I won't force my way in. I'll knock at the door. I'm not going to kick the door down. Down. I'm not going to force the door open. I call to you. I want you. I knock at the door of your heart. You, however, have to respond and allow me in. You have to open the door of your heart and allow me in. And once that happens, we have intense communication one with another. And that means that we have a relationship. It's interesting in John 17, and I don't have any notes written down or anything that I'm going to put on the screen about this, but in John 17, uh, this is the Lord's Prayer, Jesus' own personal Lord's Prayer. He is praying to his Father and is praying to his Father about the people who believe in him. And he says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I am asking you to protect them while they're in the world. And it goes on in that chapter and it says, you are in me and I am in you and they are in us, together in unity. And it's one of my favorite verses in all of the scripture because it explains the whole, the unity that we have with Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit because it goes over that. He says, I'm praying for them. I'm praying that you will protect them. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. But, and, and then he goes on to say, they are in me, you know, they belong to me. I am and you and you are in me and we are all together. This is a picture of the unity that we have with God. So when you say, I want a deep, personal, intimate relationship with God, it's something that you definitely can have. It's something that God wants you to have. Think how wonderful it is to know that Jesus really does love you, that Jesus really forgives you, that he takes care of you, and he stays with you. You know, the Bible says he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. And that's important to remember. He says uh, that he will be with you constantly until the end of the age. In other words, you, as you're living in God's hands, you're not going to go to heaven until he's ready to take you because he's not going to take you until your work is done. I know a lot of Christians fall ill. We're living in a, a world where illness hits everybody, and then people are afraid they're not going to be able to get their work done. They're not going to be able to leave the legacy that they need to leave. But I encourage people who are ill, God knows your circumstances. He's with you. The Bible says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And so therefore, uh, you don't have to worry that you're going to be taken, and your work is going to be left undone. As Christians, we always feel that our work is left undone. There's always more to do. There always will be more to do. But we need to remember that God will take us when our work is done and not before. So you will have a legacy. You don't have to worry about that at all. I had a good friend of mine. He was ordained with me who was a wonderful pastor, and he became ill, and he died. And his wife said, but he had more work to do. And he knew he had more work to do, and he fought against death so he'd be able to complete his work. But I reminded her that the Bible says that he will not take you until your work is finished. And so therefore, uh, it was important for you to realize that, that, that he, did, he didn't leave with his work undone. It feels left undone, but he has a very strong legacy. We did a lot of work together. We taught. He was also a college professor, and we were very close, so I really still miss him to this day, but I know where he is, and I know what his legacy is, and I know that his work was done because God would not take him beforehand. 
in Hebrews, and I'm going to read this off. I'm going to read it from the NIV version, and it says this, from Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6, and this is what it says. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. And so let me read that again. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. God will always take care of you. He loves you and he will always take care of you, no matter what your circumstances are. The Bible has a lot to say about God's light. And darkness is a thing that's hard to go through, because we think of darkness as the absence of light. But if you have circumstances in your life that are difficult, those things are also darkness to you. And so you might be going through all kinds of things. You could have a health problem. You could have financial problems problems. You could have problems with your friends. Uh, sometimes you might be depressed. Yes, Christians get depressed too. And maybe your children have been uh, taken away from you, or maybe your children not following God in the way that you want them to. All of these things are darkness to you. But God says a lot about the light. And I'm going to read off some verses here. They're not going to be on the screen, but just to let you know how many verses exist about light in the scripture. 2 Samuel 22, 29 says, my God lightens my darkness. Um, Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? In other words, because he is your light and he is your salvation, you have nothing to fear. Isaiah 2, uh, 2 verse 5 says, Let us walk in the light of the Lord. And Matthew 6.22 says, Your whole body will be filled with light. Your whole body will be full of light. Light means good things, knowledge, and all all of the things that God wants you to have, compassion. Uh, Isaiah 2, 5, and I read it before, but I want to read it again. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. He is our light. He is our salvation. You know, when you're in the winter months, you always look forward to summer because summer it's warm and there are flowers and there are plants in bloom and, and uh, it is light sometimes until 9 o'clock at night. It's, it can be light. Uh, but we can also, all of us spiritually, have God's light. We can have the light of life no matter what uh, time of year it is. Because remember John 3.16, and it won't be on the screen, but I want to read it to you, says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Having eternal life is also from God. It is light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So we don't have to fear and he will lead us through our lives and provide us with what we need and we don't have to worry about the darkness that sometimes engulfs us. So I'm going to close it here and uh, while we turn next week please join me then.